Disclaimer. Lore exists to help inspire creativity and story. It should not be used to lord over anyone at your game table, whether that be a dungeon master or player. Be flexible and willing to modify what exists to accommodate the story the table wishes to tell. In the Drow Pantheon exists a deity who desires nothing more than sacrifice and strength. It stands alone with no allegiances and many foes. Many have tried to guess where it came from, but its true origins remain a mystery. In this podcast, we will focus upon Ganador, alien and amorphous deity of the Dark Seldarine. I am Benjamin Dignan, aka DM Diggy, and welcome once again to Religion in the Realms. To start, I would like to make an update that is also a correction. In the recently released Mordekainen's Tome of Foes, Ganador is once again listed in the Drow Pantheon. Last podcast, I had stated Ganador distanced itself from this pantheon, but that would appear to be no longer the case. The deities of the Forgotten Realms remain in flux even in the latest version of D&D. Pronunciation the official pronunciation of this deity's name is Gan Adur. Titles Some of the titles Gan Adur goes by are That Which Lurks, The Elder Eye, and The Ancient One. It has been said to be better to refer to Gan Adur by one of its various titles, rather than its true name. Speaking Gan Adur's actual name may draw its attention to a potential victim. Ganador has been known to be worshipped as if they were Jublex, the demon lord of oozes. This title Ganador has appropriated from time to time to deceive some into worshipping it unknowingly. Portfolio and Domains Falling within Ganador's portfolio are oozes, slimes, jellies, outcasts, ropers, rebels, and all things subterranean. For those of you playing 5th edition, Ganador's domain is now mentioned in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. There, its singular domain is War. Appearance and Manifestations Ganador has been described as a massive, tentacled, amorphous creature purple in color. Ganador utilizes stealth, cloaking itself within purplish mist. These myths are also used in combat to obscure its form, challenging an opponent's ability to strike true. The fumes of the mist cause others in its radius to potentially suffer the effects of a slow spell. Ganador is capable of lashing out with multiple tentacles when it attacks, each one stretching out to a range of 30 feet. Each of these tentacles have barbed teeth that dig into the target. The target not only suffers piercing damage, but also corrosive damage from Ganador's body. Ganador can then choose to drag the target towards its maw on later rounds. The target can attempt to break out of the grip, but breaking free has the penalty of dealing further further damage from the teeth of the tentacles. Ganador is immune to all acids, drugs, and poisons. Given its amorphous nature, Ganador can freely shape itself into any shape. Typically, its avatar has formed itself into a giant purple slug. If ever the avatar of Ganador presents itself to a mortal, the mortal would only hear the writhing of its mass and an alien, undecipherable language being spoken. Ganador is able to speak telepathically though it gives its commands with one or two words. Ganador may show its influence and presence through subtle signs. Some such signs are the sudden discovery of a lone mauve rose that drips blood from its thorns or the discovery of a purple gemstone, like an amethyst, with a single golden eye that stares up from within the gem. Personal History Ganador has shifted in its level of power as a deity. First identified to be a lesser power, it reached greater deity status after the Spell Plague. 
The true origins of Gonadur are unknown and lost to time. Some believe it was a primordial force that existed in the reaches of the Underdark in the earliest days of the realms. One of the great old ones. Whether Gonadur is a being from the far realm remains unknown, but it is a known theory. Loth enlisted Gonadur's aid in her failed attempt to usurp power over the Sildarine long ago. But it is said Gonadur attempted to play both sides and have Corallon Lorethian return Gonadur to its former glory before coming to the realms. Instead, realizing Gonadur betrayed both sides, it was exiled to the dark depths of the Underdark in its ooze-like fluid state. This legend is believed to be one of the primary reasons why the followers and clergy of Lolth openly co combat the worship of Gonadur. Lolth and Gonadur have been at odds continuously in the Drow Pantheon. In 1379 Dale Reckoning, Lolth attempted to destroy Gonadur to no success. Gonadur separated from the Drow Pantheon, now to only rejoin it after the Second Sundering. During Gonadur's absence from the Dark Seldarine, it lost all of its drow worshippers. Though it retained worship amongst the Abolithic Sovereignty, a group of ancient Abolists looking to open a portal to the Far Realm on Faerun. After Loth was able to increase her power to that of a greater deity, she used her newfound powers to make Gonadur's drow worshippers forget about Gonadur. Following the Second Sundering, however, Drow worshippers have been finding their way back to the worship of Gonadur. Personality Gonadur is a chaotic evil deity. It is unpredictable and some say somewhat insane. One day, it may aid a worshipper regardless of their level of devotion, and on the next day cause the same worshipper great harm. Gonadur takes great delight in monstrous creatures hunting down mortals. It is cowardly and willing to bide its time until an opportunity presents itself to lash out at its foes. Personal Realms Just as Gonadur has moved in and out of the Dark Seldarine, Gonadur has moved in and out of different realms and planes. Before residing in the Demon Web Pits with the majority of the Dark Seldarine, Gonadur resided on the para-elemental plane of ooze in its own realm known as the Cauldron of Slime. After moving its realm to the Demon Web Pits, Gonadur kept the realm's name the same. It was a realm full of oozes, muck, and fungi. A Cauldron of Slime is lit by a phosphorescent glow that is sickly in color. Fleeing from an empowered lolf, Gonador managed to escape and establish itself in a new realm, the Dismal Caverns. The Dismal Caverns exists deep in the Underdark and has a similar environment to that of the Cauldron of Slime. With Gonador once more in the Dark Seldarine, it is unknown whether it has been brought back to the Demon Web Pits or still resides deep in the lowest levels of the Underdark. Allies and Allegiances Gonador has no known allies. Gonador resents all other deities. Enemies Gonador has many opposed deities. Many of them are deities that hold sway over the other denizens of the Underdark. Some of them include Blip Dual Poop of the Kuatoans, Deep Duera and Laduguer of the Duergar, and the Blood Queen of the Darrow. Most importantly, every other deity in the pantheon of the Dark Seldarine is opposed to Gonador. Loth has a large amount of hatred for Gonador. Given Gonador's ability to frequently claim many drow worshippers and their strained past. Stat blocks for the deity and their avatars. For those of you looking for a stat block for Gonador's avatar, there is none available in current official material released for 5th edition. But in previous editions, the designers put out stat blocks. Stat blocks for the avatars can be found in the following supplements. For 2nd edition, the Drow of the Underdark and the Demi-Human Deities supplement contain the stat block. 
For third edition, Faiths and Pantheons supplement contain the appropriate stat block. I was unable to find a stat block for the deity Gonador itself. Symbols Gonador has three symbols. The most popular is an eye in the center of a purple or violet circle, which lays atop another black circle. The second symbol is an eye with a purple pupil in both a black iris and sclera. The sclera is the visible white portion of the human eye. The last symbol is an upside down triangle, amber in color, on top of a purple background. Now here comes the confusing part that is not so easily communicated through this medium. Unfortunately, I was unable to find a printed Im image of this symbol in my research, so I cannot tell you to jump onto Google Images and type in Symbol of Ganador to see it. Perhaps it is best to draw it out for yourself, and I will also post an image of my shoddily drawn image onto Twitter. So find a drawing implement and a piece of paper. Draw an upside down triangle. Now at the top of this upside down triangle, which will be a flat side, Draw the single lower arm of uppercase letter Y to the midpoint of the triangle. Then draw out the two branches of the letter Y so that the two branches bisect, or go through, the two sides of the triangle leading to the downward facing point. If you have done it right, an eye-like shape should have formed between the midpoint of the triangle leading down to the downward point of the triangle. Central Beliefs as I did before, I would like to quote Ganador's dogma from the Demi-Human Deities supplement. All creatures have their place, and all are fit to wield power. Those who hunt weed out the weak and strengthen the stock of all. Those who rebel or who walk apart find new ways and try new things, and do the most to advance their race. Creatures of power best house the energy of life, which Ganador reveres and represents. The faithful of Ganador are to make sacrifices to the eye, persuade others to sacri sacrifice themselves to Ganador, or in service of the eye, further the knowledge and fear of Ganador, and in the end, give themselves to Ganador in unresisting self-sacrifice. Priests of Ganador are to convert all beings that they can to the worship of Ganador. They must slay all clergy of other faiths, plundering their temples and holdings for wealth to better their one lot and to further the worship of Ganador. End quote. So strong is the hate for others of another faith that Ganador takes issue with any priest of another faith who is able to leave one of Ganador's temples still alive. Ideally, such an individual would be a desirable sacrifice at the altar and should be captured. If someone receives a blessing from Ganador and does not repay that blessing within eight days with a sacrifice or other suitable offering, they will face dire circumstances. I am unsure of the significance of the number eight, but it was the number given. No priest of Ganador is to ally themselves or keep company with priests of other faiths. If they do, a sacrifice is to be made. If no sacrifice is to be found, the sitting priest is to willingly present themselves as sacrifice. Presence of the Faith Much as Ganador is amorphous, those amorphous creatures of the realms, such as oozes and slimes, worship it, though in their own alien way. It is said that Ganador held sway over all these oozes and slimes until they were unable to aid Ganador enough to bring down Loth after Loth's banishment from the Sildarine. In its rage, Ganador lashed out, redu reducing these oozes and slimes to a state of lesser intelligence. The drow who worship Ganador are known for their dissatisfaction with Loth and those subservient to her. They are drow who are outcasts, or drows looking for another way to achieve power and status. Most surface peoples who know of Ganador find its worship to be monstrous, evil, and disgusting. Still, there are small sects and cults that exist, though hidden away. 
This is an assumption on my part, but given Gondor's recent re-entry into the drow pantheon, there has likely been a resurgence in the number of drow that worship it. But the number of drow is nowhere near what it used to be after Lol's machinations. Hierarchy and Structure of the Clergy The accepted alignment of the clergy of Ganondor are chaotic neutral, chaotic evil, and neutral evil. This is a personal opinion, but I have a hard time accepting that an individual of a chaotic neutral alignment could be a member of the clergy of Ganondor, given the prevalence of sacrifice within its worship. I will grant that someone who is an initiate could hold this alignment, who is merely interested by this faith but unaware of its depravities. Ganador is not particular in those who worships it. Even though, excuse me, even those oozes with a strange intelligence understood by few can join Ganador's clergy if they, are, if they so desire. For Ganador, the number of worshippers and clergy members is held to a higher degree than individual skill and ability. Simply, it's quantity over quality. A large portion of Ganador's humanoid clergy is both drow and male. This is understandable given any male drow who dares to look elsewhere for power and status looks outside of the matriarchy seen in the cities dominated by Loth worship. Responsibilities and Duties of the Clergy and Worshippers Ganador's worshippers are instructed to go out of their way to kill and steal from the followers of Loth. Obviously, this stems from Ganador's deep-seated hatred for Lolth. The core duty of any clergy member of Ganador is to maintain a ready supply of sacrifice at the altar. Priests are given free reign in their methods, but Ganador takes greater, del greater delight in those sacrifices who offer themselves as sacrifice, whether that be under their own volition or under enchantment. While it is not required, it is encouraged that the clergy familiarize themselves with acids, poisons, and incendiary oils. The priests at these temples keep a good amount of such items in storage at all times. Orders and Priestly Bodies Some of the names given to the priestly bodies of Ganador are the Loathsome Oozes, Spawn of the Pit, Eater of Waste, the Noxious Slimes, the Creeping Doom, and Amorphous Annihilators. The priests of Ganador are collectively known together as Amorphites. One named order of Ganador was the Fanatics of the Overflowing Pit. This group operated for a long time, combating the other clergy of the rival faiths of the Drow Pantheon. They were a militaristic group, their ranks were made up of clerics skilled in combat. Their center of power was the underdark city of Lurth Dryer. That city has since fallen to ruin after a collapse in the cavern it resided in. Whether the fanatics of the overflowing pit operate elsewhere remains to be seen. Appearance and Dress Gonador desires that his priest wear vestments that are black, various shades of purple, and or various shades of red. The clergy wear long, flowing robes with loose sleeves. Over the robe is a dark-colored tabard with a symbol of Ganador upon it. Now, in the Deities and Demigods supplement, it explicitly says that they wear silver skull caps. Personally, I think that sounds a little ludicrous and silly to me, but you're the DM, so do what you will. Priests tend to let their hair grow long and keep it unbraided, but all forms of facial hair are not permitted by the clergy. While some priests might wear charms and pendants of Ganador symbols as described before, it is common for some to wear a small sphere of obsidian on a chain around their neck. These spheres are often enchanted with a permanent fairy fire spell, and they give off a dull glow at all times. When out adventuring, a priest can wear and wield whatever is necessary to fulfill their task, though they still adhere to the colors known to be pleasing to Gondor, to the point of tinting their weapons and armor. 
Rituals The elder eye expects a prayer of adulation to it at least once a day, and that prayer is to be accompanied by a sacrifice by one of its priests. Bones and food can be given in place of a sacrifice if need be. During these prayers, perfumed incense is burned in the braziers found beside most altars. If absolutely nothing can be offered, Gonador asks for a test of faith. A priest must hold their hand over an, over an open flame with nothing protecting it. While doing this, they are to say a prayer. Sometimes their hand will go unharmed, sometimes it will be burned. That is entirely up to Gonador. Smoke and flame are important to all rituals, particularly the sacrifices done in devotion to Gonador. The following ritual does not have a given name. However, it has been known in the past to be a reliable way to get in contact with Gonador. This ritual is to be done during a sacrifice where the worshipper draws their own blood. Calling on Gonador, it is said a foot-long gold eye appeared and opened its eye, bathing the worshipper in orange light. The blessing offered by this orange light and the golden eye that emits it is said to bless a creature with a greater increase in physical strength and damage output. It also has the potential to regrow missing limbs and cure any disease that the target may be suffering. If the same ritual is conducted at a physical altar to Ganadur, the ritual has the same effects, though it is said in the past that emerging from the altar will be the three tentacles from Ganadur's avatar. Given the passive roles that deities now have post second sundering, it is entirely up to DM discretion whether or not these same effects occur. General Locations of Temples and Shrines Since Gondor is a drow deity, most of its temples and shrines are found in the Underdark. In drow communities where they revere Lolth, the mere mention of Gondor's name or affiliated titles are immediate grounds for punishment. Therefore, temples or shrines can be found close to Lolth-dominated communities but hidden in the wilds of the Underdark. Upon the surface of the Forgotten Realms, there is a weak presence of Gondor worship, and any knowledge of it and its worship is known by few. A few cults do exist, and they are helmed by a single leader. These few cults tend to be found underground, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively, in decadent cities rather than out on the fringes of society. Temples to Ganador are characterized by hazy, purplish interior lights and drifting mists. While most temples to Ganador are found underground, some can be found in ruins out in the wilderness both up on the surface and both in the underdark. Some temples have mosaics on their walls depicting mortals willingly offering themselves to the sacrifice of Ganador's ooze-like servants. The floors and pillars of these temples are typically made of black or red stone and have been polished to a fine sheen. If such stone is unavailable during the construction of the temple, black and red tapestries and carpets are used to decorate the interior. The pillars of the altar chamber feature carved symbols of Ganador upon their surface. If possible, these pillars are enchanted to radiate magic which may cause fear and unease in any non-follower. Sometimes one of these pillars can grant immediate teleportation. Priests would activate these pillars to travel to a sanctuary or city. Though the enchantment on these pillars could be manipulated so that a proper command word needs to be spoken. If an incorrect word is spoken, the victim will be teleported to a monstrous lair or suffer some form of elemental damage. The altars to Gonador are placed on a series of ornate three-tiered platforms. On the first platform are drums and chimes and a singular large triangle is hung above the third. 
These instruments were used when the avatar of Gondor could be called upon readily. What capability they now have is unknown. The altar is a simple rectangle made of ugly porous stone that would definitely look out of place in an otherwise spotless temple. Flanking the altar are braziers and candelabras arranged in a triangle. The candles and the candelabras are thick and black. When lit, these candles give off a purplish flame. For some unknown reason, these candles are never consumed by flame until they are taken out of a temple. Upon touching the altar with flesh, or striking it with a large force, the ugly poor stone will fade away to reveal an altar constructed entirely of amethyst. Within the center of this altar moves an amorphous force. If someone is so willing to touch this altar after the change, they will suffer a significant amount of acid damage and possible paralysis. As was said before, an aspect and even some form of Gonador could be summoned when all instruments and braziers were used in performing a sacrifice upon an altar. After the deities of the realms have distanced themselves from the prime material after the second sundering, this effect likely no longer applies. Though a creative DM could likely come up with a lessened effect, like the summoning of one of Gondor's personal servants, or a magical item that could be wielded by a worshipper. Specific and known locations of temples or shrines. Amongst the surface folk, cults to Gondor can be found in the southern sword coast, in Thay, and on the continent of Karatur. Some of the surface temples to Gondor can be found in Kalimport, Waterdeep, and Westgate. Likely an abandoned temple to Gondor exists in the spires of Mur, to the north and east of the marching mountains. Before the spell plague, there was a sizable forest here known as the Forest of Mur, and Drow existed beneath the canopy of the trees in three distinct locations. One such drow settlement was Haldabim, which resided to the east of the marshing mountains. Here there was reported to be a temple to Gondor, but it is possible worshippers retreated to the Underdark. There is knowledge of a temple to Gondor that existed away from the Lolf-dominated drow city of Gwaladurth beneath the forest of Myrrh, so a community to Gondor may still exist in this location. Further still, Drow long ago constructed a temple to Gondor during the Crown Wars around a massive pit beneath the Forest of Myrrh. The temple known as the Elder Orb of Ooze has since fallen to ruin, but it's still said to be defended by a monster of evil in the pit put there by Gondor. In the Underdark, there are ruins of Drow cities that have been destroyed through various means. In some of these cities existed a large presence devoted to the worship of Gondor, where temples and shrines would have been plentiful. Such examples include Lurthryr, which is once known as the City of Ooze, but is now known as the Oozing Ruin. Another is Erinlin, where worshippers of Veyron and Gondor were successful in pushing out factions devoted to Lolth before the city was destroyed during the Spell Plague. Finally, one of the founding houses of Menzo Baranzin constructed a temple to Gondor in secret out on the island of Goth on Lake Donagarten. This family was found out, and the temple was sunken into the waters of the lake. It is said that the last members of this house were transformed into Gal Ropers by Gwanadar to protect what remains of this flooded temple. Sloop del Monpolop is a Kuatoan city in the Underdark. Some of the Kuatoa here started worshipping Gondor after the spell plague. The Kuatoa here lost connection with Blib Dual Pulp, and now after the second sundering, who is to say whether or not the Sea Mother has made herself known to her people once more, and if Gondor is so willing to give up these new worshippers so easily? Character Options for second edition characters, in the Demi-Human Deities supplement, they can find the features and requirements for the Amorphite, a specialty priest class in service to Gondor, along with the specific spells 
that only that are only available to worship of Ganondor. For third edition characters, in the Champions of Ruin supplement, characters can find the initiative of Ganondor feat alongside its features and requirements. In the third edition Player's Guide to Faerun, players can find the Slime Lord, a prestige class for any character who holds Ganondor as their patron deity. This character will slowly gain its abilities to become amorphous and lash out with pseudopods. 5th edition character options. For a PC who wishes to have a background that reflects their service or worship to Gonador, I have played around and made a custom background. So for scope proficiencies, I would present the character with deception and intimidation. For tool proficiencies, I would present them with alchemist supplies and poisoner's kit. For their ribbon ability or background feature, I would give them the false identity feature from the charlatan background. My reason for the false identity feature is because Gonador's worship is now in a state of resurgence and likely in drow cities and communities and up all, also on communities up on the surface, people are going to want to keep that identity and that fact about their own personal lives hidden. So I think the false identity ribbon ability is a good feature for a worshipper of Gonador background. To round it out, I would simply just present them with the equipment that is offered to the Acolyte background. Now here's just a list of classes and subclasses that I feel would work well for a character who wants to play a worshipper to Gonador in an evil campaign or for a DM to utilize in creating NPCs for their own campaign. For those who are a cleric, uh, Gonador operates in the war domain. Gonador values strengths in curtailing the weak, so this really kind of plays into that war domain. The second class I decided that would be appropriate for a worshipper of Gonador would be Druid. Uh, you don't really see often evil druids, but I think a circle of the land druid who makes their land choice the Underdark really plays into this concept of a druid who is attuned to the absolute ruthlessness of the Underdark, and I can see Gondor really being favorable to that. The third class I felt was a good fit was Fighter. And I can really see a champion fighter really fitting in the mold for someone who represents who represents strength overall. The fourth option, which probably does not come for too much of a surprise, especially because we're talking about deities, is the paladin. And for a paladin who worships Gondor, I would take the Oath of the Conquest, which is presented in Xanthar's Guide to Everything. Obviously, this oath speaks to someone who has no time for sheltering the weak and just going above everyone else to kind of achieve their own means through war and violence. The last class, it's actually rep uh, recommended in the Swords Coast Adventurer's Guide, is Warlock. Gondor may be a deity, but it is still an ancient, alien, and strange being that would serve very well as a patron to a great old one, Warlock. DM Options Gondor has a lot of monstrous worshippers, servants, and followers that a DM can make use of. Those that can be found in official 5th edition material. Uh, in the Monster Manual, you have the Abolis, the whole array of oozes in the Monster Manual, Ropers, and Gibbering Mouthers. In Volo's Guide, you have the Slithering Tracker. And in Mordekind's Tome of Foes, you have that new monster called the Oblex or Oblex. But they're two, I feel, tied in with the Mind Flare. But if you have a creative enough, I think you can manipulate the lore and story to kind of really fit in with the worship of Gondor rather than the Mind Flayer Ben. One particular monster that has a confusing identity in the various supplements is Gondor's personal servants, who are called the Gonodons. In 2nd edition, they are described as powerful ropers. However, in 3rd edition material, they are described as shape-shifting oozes who operate as spies for Gonador and his clergy. At best, I'm making the assumption that Gonador, 
Guanodons are officially the shape-shifting oozes. The powerful ropers were identified in other 2nd edition supplements as Gal Ropers. And personally, I say, why not let Gonador have two powerful servants to call upon? Unfortunately, a creative DM will have to come up with a stat block for the Gal Roper, because I was unable to find it and can't really point you in a good direction. However, a stat block does exist for the Go- Gonadon in the Monster Compendium Monsters of Faerun supplement from 3rd edition. Another monster I read about that is associated with Gonador is the Oavolachia, which is a aberrant insectoid-like creature capable of shape-shifting and necromancy. Its stat block is not available in 5th edition material, but it can be found in the 3rd edition monster manual. For NPCs, a DM is not lacking for stat blocks in my opinion. Uh, this is just a extended list that I've made up just kind of looking through the various supplements that we have available to us in 5th edition. So in the monster manual, you have the Drow, the Drow Elite Warrior, the Drow Mage, the Acolyte, the Cultist, the Cult Fanatic, the Thug, the Veteran. In Volo's Guide is the Blackguard, the Champion, the War Priest, the Warlock of the Great Old One, and the Warlord. And finally, in Mordekindian's Tome of Foes, you have the Drow Inquisitor, the Drow Shadowblade, and another cool option that's been presented in that book is Demonic Boons. Now, Gondor is not a demon, although he does, or might, be residing on the Abyss. What I'm trying to get at is that there's a really cool Demonic Boon that's offered to followers and cults of Jublex, and I would consider, as a DM, taking a look at that and kind of adding it maybe to a few of your NPCs in your campaigns. Now the last thing I'd like to talk about are those magic items that could easily be associated with the worship of Gondor. Now in the DMG for the alchemical side of the worship of Gondor you have the alchemy jug, the dagger of venom, oil of sharpness and oil of slipperiness, and finally the potion of poison. For the warring side, you have Gauntlets of Ogre Power, Maces of Smiting, Mace of Terror. And finally, for priests or clergy members who go out and try to capture psych- sacrifices, they might utilize the Iron Bands of Bolaro, the Rope of Entanglement, and the very flavorful and very appropriate Tentacle Rod. In the player's handbook, you have the description of the alchemist's fire, the vials of acid, and vials of poison that would be appropriate for any character or NPC who is really leaning into that alchemical side that is important to the worship of Gonador. And finally, there's just some couple of flavorful items that are found in the common item descriptions in Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Uh, the first one I picked out was the Armor of Gleaming, just because... It really seems, it's not expressly said, but it seems that Gonador worshippers have a big, big stake in cleanliness. So I feel a person who is martial and then they're in the worship of Gonador, they like to keep their armor clean at all times. And finally, is the last thing is the Ursat's eye. The eye is a very important symbol of in the worship of Gonador, so I can just imagine this one priest having their eye cut out for whatever reason might be, perhaps it was in sacrifice, perhaps it was in war, but this golden eye, the ersatz eye that's been placed in their eye, is a viable replacement. And if a DM is just looking for, well, what what weapon is associated most with Gonodor and his warriors, that would be the amorphous tentacle, which is why the tentacle rod magic item is so important. But a lot of the worshippers of Gonador instead kind of re-flavor that to be just the bludgeoning damage that a Warhammer would give out. So the Warhammer is expressly mentioned to be the chosen weapon for the followers of Gonador. Alright, thank you for listening to Religion in the Realms once again. If you're interested in keeping up with the release of future podcasts, you can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and follow the podcast Twitter account at Realms Religion. If you wish to get in touch with me personally, my personal Twitter handle is at Shiv's Embrace. 
The spelling for that is Sierra Hotel India Victor Sierra Echo Mike Bravo Romeo Alpha Charlie Echo. Next episode will be a very important important one in the series on the Drow Pantheon. We're going to be taking a look at the Queen of Spiders herself, Lolf. Until next time, may Timora look kindly upon your dice rolls. Helm protect you, and Lathander light your path. Music for this episode, Shadowlands 2, Bridge, by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0.